Give me a shot here. Okay, give it another. Okay, just close it down, and at some point, I'm gonna have you blow that baby. All right, I got you. It's the boo boo zay. Um, so, a couple little deals. Um, last week, that when we were together, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the good news, and uh, I think we all. As Christians, sort of feel like I know what the good news is, but I'm not sure we really do. I think we think we know what the good news is. Um, I think the big news, the good news, is bigger than the news that we're telling. If, if you remember anything from last week, I, I showed this video. It's just the good news, and then I was, I think we truncated this whole Bible into a four-page little pamphlet, like the one I got at the fair. You know, what's your missing uh, by not being a Christian? Uh, hell, you know. It's, and so uh, it's concerning to me. And I talked to you uh, last week as well about this uh, reality that the Fuller Youth Institute, which is studying all kinds of research on your generation, on millennials and Gen Z, they are saying now, this is the hottest topic, and even we talked about this in the youth ministry class I am teaching, that. 50% of kids, and these aren't just kids that were sort of nominally hanging out in your youth groups. These are 50% of high school kids who are very involved in their youth group, like helping lead the middle school ministry in Bible studies, going on the mission trips. I mean, these are the key kids. Some, some of them would be like you in this room. Like, I was really involved. 50% of them walk away from their faith after their first year of college, which... It's just an amazing statistic. And it makes us wonder, particularly for people like you who've been in youth ministry for 35 years and people really good at youth ministry, what in the heck we've been doing if 50% of kids are walking away? And so actually right now, the, one of the hottest topics in, in, in the church is, what are we doing in youth ministry? And by the way, what are we doing in church? Because all of you, you end up becoming the church and is it working? Not only is youth ministry, we're wondering, is it working or did it work? Um, is the church working? Because it's shrinking in America. And here's, the, so what they decided to do is study the other 50%. Hey, what about the 50% of kids that didn't walk away from their faith? What do we know about what uh, they understood or how their churches work and how their youth ministry work? And here's what they found. The youth ministries of the kids who's Faith stood strong through college, did not walk away, made a couple big shifts in their, in their approach. Number one, they talked less about doctrine and behaviors and more talk about the person of Jesus. And what was important, we talked about this a little last week, right? Um, shift number two, uh, these churches went deep. They didn't truncate the gospel down to a little pamphlet, uh, into a formula or a fact. Rather, they focused on the redemptive narrative of the Bible. I'm going to say this again. The redemptive narrative of the Bible. The Bible is this big. But sometimes we've made the good news like one little page. So why do we need this whole person? If, that, if the key is a pamphlet. Uh, Shift number three. Talk less about heaven later and more about life here. So I kind of summarize what they're saying is, hey, the ones, the kids that hung on through college, their faith, didn't walk away. Their churches, their ministers about talk more about Jesus. They talk about a bigger story. And I'll say this like we talked last week. Jesus is a part of a bigger story. And they talk about life here. Just what they discovered. And we talked about the need to tie Jesus into a bigger story what we call redemptive narrative of the Bible. That's what we talked about last week when we started Genesis. And Jesus is a part of this whole story of why we're here on this, on this planet. That the God of the universe breathed into us his image and created every person to live into this wild, beautiful, extravagant call to bring his stuff to this place, right? And from a, to a God who loves us, who, who didn't abandon us when we sinned. He came down and hung out with us when we sinned. 
But it, instead, he covered our shame with clothes. Like, yeah, those fig leaves aren't working. Let me give you some really nice clothes here. And then he walked out of the garden with us into the chaos, the waters, the deep. You know, the, the chaos of life. And a God who forgives our sins, and I think calls us to live into our original blessing. I'm not saying we're no sin. I'm just saying what's most true is you're originally really blessed. And we live into this, what we call, we've said this several times, this threefold purpose. We are called from the very beginning, and Jesus reminded of this. Jesus came to remind us of this story, that we were created to reflect God, to be in right relationship with God, with each other, with the earth. And we were created to do God's stuff. Now, the church, I would say, over the last several hundred years, has focused so much on what Jesus saves us from, that we've forgotten what Jesus saves us for. Even when we listen to some of our music, maybe even in this chapter, sometimes it's a lot about what we've been saved from. But so we need to remember we're also saved for something. If all we do is bring kids, let's say, to church camp, or young life camp, or whatever, so that we can get them to stand up on night six, or throw a log in the fire and give some testimony or something, that, uh, you know, I pray that prayer. We fail. But that's all we do. Because statistics will say that will not last. In fact, when I speak at camp now and I see kids stand up, I, I believe in Jesus, I'm looking at this crowd and I get a tear in my eye thinking 50% of you won't be doing this without any of you. Because the big question that kids are asking is, okay, I, I stood up night six at camp, I cried, I, I prayed a prayer, now what? And if we can't fill in that now what, I think by about your first year out of college, you go, okay, very well. I, I don't know if this story is big enough. Uh, I teach a class called Evangelism and Discipleship. Some of you should take it in the fall. It's, it's pretty fun. We unpack even more of this stuff. Uh, one of the things I do in this class is I bring in some friends of mine, some, some people even on this campus, who are not Christians. Um, some who have walked away from their faith. And I, I, I play Oprah Winfrey and I interview them in front of my class and we just talk. So I'm trying to convert them. I just want to listen to what, what they have to say. Uh, ask them, <laughs> one of the questions I asked them last year was, hey, uh, do you know what Christians call you? And they're like, mm -hmm. and, and then one guy goes, oh yeah. I go, what? He goes, lost. And I go, how does it make you feel? He goes, I hate that. Like, I don't feel lost. But they, they go, oh yeah, all right. I'm, I'm a non-Christian. I'm a non-believer. -non and so I just listen to what those who aren't Christians think about what Christians think about them. We just have this inter interview. Uh, and then I ask, what do you think the, the, the main message of the church or Christians are trying to give to the world? And sometimes they say, well, love, be nice, be good. But most of it is, um, you're a sinner. You better get it together or you're going to burn in hell. I go, and I start going, honestly, you, and you go, that, that's what I think we, we feel we hear. Um, Hussam, who uh, used to be a Christian, but now he's an atheist, um, he made this statement last year, uh, which is pretty amazing. I've heard this among several other people. Um, he says this, I feel that um, when I became a Christian, I actually, and, and maybe if you were trying to convince me to become a Christian again, that becoming a Christian actually makes me a worse person. Uh, it seems to me that Christians have no concern about justice on earth because they're so preoccupied with forgiveness in heaven. So becoming a Christian actually makes me more bigoted, less caring, more mean uh, than, than being an atheist. Which I don't agree with, but I just had to listen. To the world, the church seems really concerned, and I said this last week, about getting us there when I think Jesus was at least equally concerned, but I would even venture to say more concerned, but at least equally concerned about getting there here. So tonight, what I want to do, I want to talk about this third shift, this, this shift. Number three, talk less about heaven there and more about life here. I want to talk about that. 
Um, one, of, one of the most beautiful examples, I think, of this third shift about talk less about heaven, getting to heaven someday by some formula to get to heaven, talk more about life, the kingdom here. One of the most beautiful examples, I think, of this is our Young Lives Ministry. Um, I think, is Priscilla here? Maybe she's not here tonight, but uh, she, she is involved, maybe trying to step into to Young Lives. Teen Moms work. My, my wife works with Teen Moms. And I love this ministry because these ladies are caring so holistically about these, these teen moms. Many of them come to know Jesus, but it's a long road for them. They've been so hurt in their life. Um, they are patterning, patterning that their messages around this big story. You ought to hear the way they, they speak about the good news. That the good news isn't just about where you go when you die, but they're speaking to these young ladies uh, about life right now. And they're doing something about it. Like they're getting them into, into homes. They, they, they started a teen mom's home. There's so many cool things that they're doing. It's, it's so easy in, in young life or in church ministry to just say, like to say to these girls who are in such need with, with babies and that are 14 years old, you go, you know, you need to get Jesus. You need, you need to pray and get saved. You need Jesus. And to say, well, what we do is we talk about Jesus. And I want to say this. I think, well, that's where I'm going. Uh, I think that every kid needs Jesus. But Jesus isn't everything that every kid needs. I, I really think everybody needs Jesus. But I don't think that Jesus is everything that every kid needs. When I think about Marina, my wife met Marina, she had a, a one-year-old little boy, Alex, she was 15 years old. She had an abusive father, she was living with her mom in this little shack with no heat because they couldn't pay it and he was about to get evicted. She got pregnant, a six-year-old punk. I gotta be careful with her, she had, she was some, I had just been around this enough to know like, sometimes you just wanna pound boys. And who was still trying to be around her, trying to help her. She moved out from her mom because her mom was turning out and going from man to man to man. It was weird. And so she got convinced to go with her boyfriend to his house, which was a meth house, a drug house. And in the midst of this, her little one-year-old son was crawling on the floor and took a pill, not a pill. And it put him in a of shock. We got a call at about 10 o'clock crying the phone at the Valley Hospital saying, can you come down? I think Alex, my son, is about to die. So then I get a call, we go down. The doctor was in the emergency hall trying to figure out what he took. We don't know what he took. And uh, he's just shaking. His heart rate is off. My wife is holding me and she's crying. My boyfriend's there. And I was just, I went out for a walk with him. He's just this little kid. Managed to get him stabilized, managed to pump his stomach. He had taken an amphetamine, and it was amazing he survived. And then she was there looking at her boyfriend, looking at us, and saying, I need a place to go. I don't have a home, and I can't go back with you. There was a little fight. You can't go back. You're, you're, you're mad now. And I had to take him out of here. I don't just take back home with you. And Linda and I just said, You're coming with us. And we opened her, our home to her, and she lived in our, our basement. And this story was, is so beautiful. We got her into this teen mom's house and uh, with about three other teen moms. And Lynn and I would go down once a month and cook dinner down there. And uh, one night, I cooked homemade pasta. And they're all, you know, uh, all the teen moms and babies are there. And we're sitting on the table, it's chaos. Babies crying, whatever. <clears throat> Sit down. Alex is only about two, just about a year, two and a half, maybe years old. And she'd been coming to club, coming to things, and uh, we were about ready to go, and Marina goes, hey, Alex, would you like to pray? And he, and this was just this moment where I go, God's here. We bow our head, and little Alex prays this little baby prayer. And I'm just thinking in, in my mind where she was, what could have happened. I mean, yes, Marina made it Jesus, and she's got the answer. Alex, her son, is praying. But Jesus wasn't everything 
Marina needed. She needed a house. She needed a warm place to stay. Um, and the beauty of the good news, because Marie, Marina needed to know that the good news stands up for justice, stands up for broken systems, and stands up for the uh, oppressed and those who can't afford them. The good news stands in the gap when everyone else is pushing you down. No. So uh, this is interesting. I want to take a look at uh, Jesus' first major public message. This is his first big message. Like some would call this his inaugural address. And we're right in the middle of a political season where the State of the Union just happened. And everybody's trying to say, this is what I'm going to be about as I uh, you know, try to be president next November's election. So we're right in the middle of it now. Jesus comes into his hometown, and it's like all of the youth groups get together and go, hey, we hear our homeboy's back. Jesus is back in town. We don't know where he's been for a while, but he's here, and they're saying stuff about him. We should open up a synagogue, a church, and invite all the youth groups, all the young life clubs, that have an all-area youth event. Let's hear what he has to say. A big church conference. So all the people come, and uh, here's the story. We read it right here. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was the custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And rolling it, he found the place where it is written. Now, this is actually Isaiah chapter 61. It was handed to him. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, to recover your sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of Jubilee. Some of you are about to say the year of the Lord's favor, which is in the Old Testament called the year of Jubilee. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them today, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Oh man, I would just love to be there. Like, you know, they're like, who's this guy? Jesus kind of goes, not today, boys. And he's going to walk. You know, just like, whoa. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you. If you've ever had at a youth group, your youth pastor or your pastor give a message that just got you so pissed off that the whole church grabbed him and took him to the edge of a cliff. I mean, this, there was something like, what in the heck is going on here? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. I mean, this, this is the craziness, right? I mean, I mean this, this world that Jesus entered was out of control. I mean, when Jesus showed up, let, let me just give you a little history of the world. Uh, this much of the Bible, let me tell you about this much of the Bible, right up to this story. Because this, this is what the, 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 the history of the world is. You just read this, all this stuff, right up to Jesus. It's a story, it's like the craziness of the six o'clock news. All the craziness you leave here in the six o'clock news is right here, in this book much of the Bible. I mean, it's, it, it's about domination and war and violence, and ethnic cleansing, and rape, and incest. It's a story about how the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. <clears throat> it's a story about racism and slavery. It's a story about a God who sets up these priests and says, gosh, you guys are losing the story. Remember the image of God, reflect me. You know, be in relationship, do God stuff. So God sets up priests. And the priests are supposed to remind the people of the story they were meant to live in. But the priests themselves become corrupt. I mean, they become as corrupt as the empire that they were screaming against. 
and they began oppressing the people. The priests created a system that favored them. We're the chosen race. We're the special spiritual pastors. We're the Jews, not those other Gentiles. So by the time Jesus was born, the land was being occupied by Rome, the most powerful nation on, on earth, the most powerful empire ever. They were brutally, Rome was brutally taxing the poor. And they were taxing everybody. The poor really felt it for their incredible war machine, the roads they wanted to build. And if anybody was against Caesar, who they considered a god, they were put to death. They were put to death. I mean, it was called Kyrios Kaiser, Caesar is Lord. When Jesus came and said, Jesus is Lord, Kyrios Christos, the Roman government went, wait a minute. I mean, that's the death penalty if somebody else is claiming to be a god like Caesar. I mean, they were a, there was a group of, of, of religious leaders, pastors of the day called the Pharisees, who invented 600, <coughs> write this down, 613 rules of exclusion. 613 rules that if you broke, God was against you, and so are we, you cannot even come into our church. And if you broke one of these rules, you had to go to the temple and go through a serious system of sacrifice. And it really affected the poor. I mean, you've got to imagine this. The only way God forgives you is if you kill something, a, a, a little bird if you're really poor, or a, a lamb. Or, and, and if you're in poverty, you have this incredible, terrible choice. I either feed my family with the little, the, the, the little I have, or I take it and I sacrifice it so that God loves me. I mean, that's a beautiful choice. I mean, and I couldn't just bring my own sheep to get sacrificed. I had to buy special temple animals. If you recall, they set the temple up like a Walmart where there was special money and special sacrificial animals that only you could buy there at a cost that was jacked so the priests could live so happy. That's why Jesus walked into the temple and turned it upside down, right? I mean, this is crazy. The priest said, the priest said, the rich people are blessed. Those who make it are blessed. Those who don't make it the poor are cursed. That's obvious. I mean, there must be something that happened. They heard, even the disciples said, hey, how is the guy born blind, Jesus? Was it he, he had the sin or his parents? Which is it? I mean, this was the system. The priest told him that's how God works. I mean, you're, if you're rich, you're blessed. If you're born, you're not blessed. God must be cursing you. You probably have sinned in your life. If you were blind or you were crippled or you were deaf, it's because God was cursing you. Your parents sinned or something. And that's how God rolls. And if you were a prostitute, if you were a tax collector, or if you were a drunkard, if you were a kid going to Capernaum who was disabled or had some special disability, you were cursed. If you, if you were a teen mom, you can't come into our church. Black lives matter? Black lives matter? No lives matter, except for special chosen people, the Jews, and especially us. We run the temple. And it's in to that context that Jesus steps into the first all area youth group gathering and gives his first inaugural address. You get it? I mean, this, this, that's what's going on. Jesus walks in and says, okay, I'll, I'll say a little word. And they wanted to throw him off a cliff. I mean, here's what's amazing. Uh, this is Jesus' first public announcement. This is it. This is what he's saying. Here's what I'm coming to do. Remember the, the, the third shift that we talked about? Talk more about life here, not about where we go. Well, uh, what's pretty amazing, just stop for a minute and think about this. It's pretty amazing what Jesus doesn't say in his inaugural address. And what most of us might think he should say. I mean, he didn't say this. Good afternoon. Welcome, sinners. Yeah, that's what you're here. You're all sinners. And you better hang on for about three more years. Because about three years, uh, you're going to hang on the cross. And uh, then you're going to have to pray that I can forgive you because uh, that's what's going to forgive you. So just hang on because you're going to go to hell. That's the big deal. Until I die, you better hope you live. Because it's getting serious now. Uh, that's just it. Pray. You get to go to heaven. Believe in what I'm going to do. Or you're going to just be done. Good news. Thank you very much. That's not what it says. I mean, this is incredible. What? What's going on here? I mean, 
Here is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is speaking a 600-year-old prophecy from Isaiah, chapter 61. Now, you got to understand, Isaiah was the hot prophet. And it would be like the Beatles. They'd be like, oh, bring on Mars. They'd be like, ooh, Cardi B. I don't know. They knew the words. They knew everything about, they, they, they knew the songs of Isaiah. He was the hot prophet. In fact, you, you read, it says, in the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, it even says this, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. And again and again, Jesus, I have come in the, in the line of Isaiah the prophet. So Isaiah was pretty serious. Isaiah was like uh, the Beatles or something of the prophetic world, the Coldplay in the prophetic world. Or I don't know. Everybody just knew the song that someday Isaiah was saying, way X 30 years ago, God was going to come and turn the system right side up. That's what Isaiah was always promised. The question was, he was going to turn it right side up for who? It, it kind of seems to be pretty close to home today. That's the question that seems to are asking right now politically. This is all working for who? I mean, it couldn't be that God would come and make it right for those people. And there were three key phrases that would have ticked people off in that all church city gathering. And, and you don't hear it. But it would be like somebody said, oh, Christmas. And you go, oh, you have all these images. Or, oh, the Super Bowl, the 4th of July. You would have all these images. They were these images. Here's the three things that Jesus said. One was jubilee. The other was a widow in Zarephath and Naaman the Syrian. And the third was today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. Those are the three things that people would went, what? And we go, yeah, like, what? Well, let's unpack this a little bit. I mean, because those statements would have rocked the youth room. Jubilee. Everybody knew what Jubilee was. Would you just turn to your neighbor and say Jubilee? Just turn to your neighbor. Jubilee. jubilee. Yeah. Uh, by the way, it, it literally, Jubilee literally means sound the horn. Cam, would you stand up and just sound the horn? <laughs> Thank you. about to happen. Jubilee. Uh, turn to your neighbor. What do you know about Jubilee? On your mark, get set. Every 49th or every 15th year. And you know there's going to be terrible. Property goes back to you for others. Deaths were redeemed. Can you imagine if that still happened? It'd be pretty powerful. That's why the Jews never did it. Wait, so technically... It's spoken Jews. about in Leviticus chapter 35. Jews are still bound to this. Yeah, they know all about it. But it is even now. Jubilee. But they don't. <laughs> okay, anybody? What do we know about Jubilee? Just a couple things. What is it? It means... Sound the horn. There's something big's about to happen. Anybody? Jubilee. It's an Old Testament thing. All the wealth of the nation is redistributed. Yeah. Go to Leviticus chapter 25, the place to start, and read about Jubilee. Most theologians don't believe that Israel ever obeyed it, ever. But if you read about it, God set up the system that on the 49th year, the end of the 49th year, which, by the way, uh, Hebrews are all into numbers, like that's seven sevens, like it's a perfect, perfect, like seven sevens, like 49 years, you know, like every seven years, every seven days you have a Sabbath. Well, on the seventh, seventh year, 49th year, everybody gets a Sabbath, and here's what it is. All of the wealth was redistributed equally again. Debit cards were canceled. What else do we know about the energy? Debit, debit cards, if you owe debt, freebie, back to zero, we're all good. Your debit card is not working. Fire it up again. What else do we know about Jubilee? Anything else? Slaves were released. Yeah. Radical in a slave culture that God would set this up. Now check this out. Every 49th year, God said to Israel, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take all the wealth, all the land you grab, and I want you to redistribute it. 
And because it would be like this, after 50 years, somebody's husband dies and a, and a poor woman with their children can't farm and work their land and they can't make enough profit. And so the guy next to him goes, hey, you know, uh, what if I just bought some of your land and give you some money? And, okay, so you get to buy the land. And then they can't still make money. And what if I buy, what about all your, you work for me? Okay. And, and you could begin to see how, how this all works. But at the end of the 49th year, God said, I want you to go back and say, hey, uh, Kendra, uh, here's all your land back. And I actually bought some more. Let's divide it and get a little more this time. We're starting over from scratch. It's all even. We're starting. Everybody gets an equal start. Sound the horn. We all get to start over. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Cancel your debts. Here we go. Uh, by the way, turn to your neighbor. Why do you think God wanted to enact something like that? Turn to God. Why do you think God would enact something like that? Do you want this to be coming? No. You never know. He wants us to look after each other and be coming and be dependent upon him. And can you do that in a capitalistic society? I know this much. About 15 years ago, Final from you too was so captured by this story of Jubilee that he started, it's now called the One Campaign, but when he started it, it was called the Jubilee Debt Campaign, started by Bonnells and a bunch of other people who were asking Western countries to forgive third world debt because we're making a freaking lot of money on keeping them impoverished by making them pay interest on debt money we gave to them so they could get out of poverty. And Bono looked at the year of Jubilee in the Bible and said, that's God. In fact, it was a part of what brought him back to God in some incre incredible ways. And he started this Jubilee debt campaign because he believes it's wrong to hold people captive by debt. We should, now, we should blow the horn and say, you're free of it. Let's start it over. Let's start over. Why do you think God enacted this? Any thoughts? Why do you think God enacted this, John? will get richer, the poor will get poorer. And so God said, well, I'm not going to let that happen. And by the way, all this land and stuff you think you own, it's not each other's anymore. I own them all. It's a reminder. Now, can you imagine <laughs> some president to say, you imagine this? There's no freaking way. I mean, we would have, I, I, we would have this war. But the idea is beautiful. That everybody gets a fair chance. I mean, this is amazing. Is, is amazing. I mean, every 49th year, and it's like Jesus did, did uh, he blew it up. He said to announce the year of Jubilee. Can you imagine how some poor people would have felt that one way? Yeah, but if you were a part of the system, there's, but some people are going, Jubilee, I got nothing. And other people are like, this is not good news. Uh, he also would have freaked people out by this statement. A widow inciting and Naaman the Syrian. Uh, these were two cities, by the way. Two groups of people. It's modern day Lebanon, by the way. The, these were groups of people that the Jews absolutely hated. The, their inhabitants were just outcasts. They couldn't come into the temple, into church. And Jesus, of all the stories he could have picked, he picked these two crazy outlying stories of these prophets who went to these unknown crazy people that right now in the where Jesus was speaking, everybody in that room was going, and we hate those people. And Jesus said, yeah, and when there was a famine, God sent Elisha to that people you hate, not to your own people. What do you think about that? Oh, and then to that guy Naaman, the Syrian, the Syrian, you hate that place? Yeah, God actually healed that guy and not all your own inside your people. Man. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, the, the feelings... By the way, two of your greatest, pro greatest prophets, Elijah and Elisha, were sent by God to all the people you hate. That, that would have bothered some people. Unless you were from the south. Even though, unless you were from there. 
And then the other third phrase that would have just blown up the all church conference was when Jesus said, and by the way, today all this stuff that Isaiah was talking about is fulfilled right here in your presence. And basically, is this fulfilled right here? I mean, basically, Jesus came in to the all church conference in his inaugural address and said this Reset. Boop. Uh, you bring the system to work for you. Everyone you're against, God is for. I can just see people who are, couldn't come in the temple looking out from the outside, you know, looking in. Everybody you're against, God is for. Oh, and by the way, I am God. It's time to start the story over. Blow the horn. Jubilee. Those on the losing team are going to score a goal. <laughs> and uh, they said, no, we're going to take you out for a goal. Maybe, maybe this will help you. Like when I, one of my most lasting memories is in 1965. I was about eight years old, and I had this memory of sitting with my mom one afternoon on the couch beside her, watching a black and white TV, while a guy named Martin Luther King marched a group of black people over the Montgomery Street Bridge from Selma. And I remember as a kid, it's, it's just blazing in my mind. John, you probably remember you're a little older than I am, but I was a kid watching this when dogs, it was filmed, live news, when dogs and police were beating these people up. And uh, maybe this will help you out. Years ago, this movie came out. And would you hit the lights back there for me? Uh, um, and this might help you. Just if you've ever seen the, the most motion picture, some, it's about this very thing. Here it is. Did you get the I never got that kind of Jesus in Sunday school. I mean, I got this Jesus. I mean, I, I, I never thought, like, I, I, I don't know, I just kind of felt like Jesus was this, uh, in high school, this figure that was just off in heaven somewhere, didn't really care about the things that I cared about. Um, and maybe when I came to know Jesus, I just wanted to know enough about Jesus to get the get out of hell free card, so that I could just get on with my life. That that somehow I don't I didn't believe that God really cared about the stuff that I cared about, like like global warming. I didn't God care about that, or racism, or ethnic profile, or war. Or poverty. I just thought I didn't think God cared about that. It was all about a cross transaction that if I prayed I could get and then get, uh, you know, get, get out of jail free card. Like, uh, I didn't think he, he cared about teen moms. 
who even if they work a full day at Taco Bell, can't make enough money in a 35, 40 hour shift to pay rent or any child care. That's the system we've created. I, I didn't think God cared about why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. I, I didn't think God cared about why 17 million children in America go to bed hungry. 17 million in America go to bed hungry in this name. Of why my high school coach was a racist. And why my college right here cost $50,000 a year to go to, which is amazing. But I go, what? what? And why there are so many young people committing suicide. And why every day, nine people die from gun violence in America. I didn't think that, that God cared about things like why people, young children are separated from their parents at the border. Or my friend Guy got arrested, a beautiful guy doing Young Life in, in Sunnyside, and for a year had to stay in Mexico while we had to work to come and try to get him back here because he got deported. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. God is concerned about what happens when we die. Uh, don't say, can't us think God is concerned about when we die? He is. But he's also really concerned about right now. I mean, Jesus walked into that Young Life Club room and is opening address to the public and, and reminded us that what we do about getting heaven here really matters to God. And here's a look. Jesus didn't just give these big speeches, like some big political speech. Jesus was different than our politicians. He actually did something about it. Like he lived it out. I mean, check this out, okay? Here's a story. You know it really well. Uh, Jesus <coughs> goes into Jericho, and he was passing through, and there was a man there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people who saw this began to mutter. All the people who saw this began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. We all know this story. Zach was a notorious tax collector of the worst. That might work for the mafia. He was a cheat, a liar, he exploited people, and was siding with the oppressive Roman Empire to cheat people out of taxes for the war machine for Rome. He was the most hated guy in the village of Jericho. And I love his statement in verse 5, where it says, When Jesus reached the spot, now I don't know what the spot is, but <laughs> he reached the spot. He looked up and he said to Zacchaeus, Zach, come down here immediately. I'm going to stay at your house today. So he came down and once welcomed him gladly, and all the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. I mean, we've all heard this talk many, many times. I don't know what Zach would have thought when Jesus stopped under his tree. That would have been a weak spot. He would have said, I can see you. I'm God, by the way. Come down. Hey, Zach, just come down. I don't know what Zach was thinking, thinking when he started coming down the tree. I mean, I don't know what you would think if God stopped under your tree. But he comes down. I don't think he expected this. Zach, let's go to McDonald's. I don't think he expected that. Something happened. Zach, and here's the truth. Zach didn't just climb a tree because he was short. I mean, if you went down to the parade that day when people knew Jesus was coming down, and Zach were to come up and try to get, hey, and I'm standing here with my family, and I know who Zach is, I'm saying, what are you doing, Zach? And no, no, you don't stand by my kids, all right? Yeah, I know who you are. Yeah, you know. I know that you just took me up. You better watch this, bro. Seriously, do not stand by my family. He was the most hated guy. So he didn't just climb a tree to see Jesus. He actually probably climbed a tree to get away from the freaking people that hated his guts. And what's beautiful is Zach got found. I don't know what Zacchaeus and Jesus talked about over lunch. I know that Jesus didn't hand him a track. I know that 
Jesus, Jesus didn't say, hey, God loves you so much today that he's willing to die on a cross for you. Because the cross is now. I think they talked about poverty and money and power. And I think Zach's heart melted when he looked into the eyes of Jesus, into the loving presence of Jesus. And I know that Zach, in that moment, discovered the story that he was meant to live in. And he lived it out. Zach came away from the moment of Jesus, and he reflected God. I mean, somehow he, there was some relationship that happened between he and Jesus, and he came out and he lived into his true story. He reflected God. He brought jubilee to the town that he had cheated. He paid back four times the amount he stole. And it's amazing that Jesus says, look at that. That's salvation. Today, salvation's coming. But he did say, hey, Zach prayed a prayer. And asked me in as his personal Lord and Savior. He looked at what Zach did with his life and said, There's salvation. The dead and salvation is coming. The story ends with a night six camp testimony. Zacchaeus stood up. We call it in young life, like on day six of camp, we call it a say so, where people can stand up and say, so, say what God has done in their life. Zach stands up and says, Man, look, Lord, I gave everything, half my possessions to the poor. If I cheat anybody, out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And he said, today salvation is coming to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That was lost. Jesus brought jubilee to Zach. Zach brought jubilee to his town. A chance to start the story over. Can you imagine getting Becky back four times? You and she's like, woo! We're in the money tonight. You know, we're going down to Clicker Daggers. We're going to, you know, I don't know. We're going to go party down. It's, this is unbelievable. He gave half his possessions. And I just want to say this. The first all-city gathering, Jesus' public inauguration announcement, wasn't just spiritual. It was social. It was political. It was economic. And it's the insight that the Fuller Union Institute discovered that helps kids stick to their faith. That it wasn't just about a transaction to get my butt to heaven, but it was also about bringing a kingdom here right now. That kids who hung on to their faith in college heard a, a message about heaven coming here rather than a cosmic transaction, transaction that lets me get to heaven you know, later. See, and I want to just say this. I, I wrote this today saying this. Our message when we think about the good news, and you're going to have a chance later in this class to express to one of your classmates what you think the good news is. I just want to say this. Our message is a message that brings hope to people rooted, not in a state of heaven, but in engagement right now. Not in evacuation, but in reclamation of what God intended. Not in leaving, but in staying and overcoming evil with good, as Romans tells us to do. That's what we're called to do. We're not just saved from something. We're saved for something. Don't forget that. It's kind of what Chung was talking about. When you look at that video, you know, and you do a circle, you know, we were designed for good, original blessing. We've been damaged by evil. We've been reformed by Jesus. Jesus came to Zach, and something transforms our lives, not just to get us to heaven, but that we now are sent together to heal a broken and crazy world. This is our call. Good news is better than uh, monopoly is to get out of jail free time. Now, I want to stop. I'm stressing a point. I can't wait to be here. I believe Jesus is personal. Um, I believe Jesus makes a huge difference in my life. I, I do think about what happens when I die. But I'm more concerned about right now. I'm more concerned about bringing that kingdom right now. If we can't present and live out a compelling picture of, let's say, Jesus today marching in a Black Lives Matter rally, 
for it. We can't paint a compelling picture of Jesus standing against economic systems that favor the rich. Or we can't imagine uh, a God who would stand up against an education system in our poor urban areas that is foundationally set up to fail because the tax is so low and the zoning is so bad. If we can't stand up against an economic system in which uh, a teen mom who has a full-time job at Taco Bell can't even afford to pay rent anywhere to live, if we can't show this generation that God actually cares for this earth and his creation, and that as Christ followers, we should be the most concerned about the environment, if we can't stand up for a stranger or for a refugee in which Matthew 25 says, I was a stranger, Jesus said, and you welcomed me, if we can't show them that, that God cares a lot about these sorts of things, then I'm just going to say this. I think this is why students walk away from the faith. That the Peace Corps, the Red Cross, and Teach for America will. Because students flock to them because they're actually doing something to make a difference in this world. Because I think uh, there's a lot of kids who still believe today, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if becoming a Christian would make me the worst person. But I'm still uh, happy minded that I just have no work to do. I want to end with this. Um, the Lord's Prayer. Will you stand? And we'll use the word trespasses. Grab a hand. This is the Lord's Prayer. That's great. We've got a couple of circles here. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven.